For those of you who watched my trailer, knows that there was a break in a case I had been working on. And out where we live, it's not often that someone goes missing, especially a 27-year-old mother of two young boys. But everywhere we went, her missing poster was there. This is Natalie Pearl Jones. She was last seen leaving a 4th of July party with friends at Jackson's Gap on Lake Martin, which is located in Opelika, Alabama. That was around 10.30 p.m., but Opelika is an hour behind Georgia, and I never did clarify if they were going by Eastern Standard Time or by Alabama time. But more than two hours later, at 12.52 a.m., she sent a text message to a friend who had been at the party saying, I made it, thanks. That was the last time anyone would ever hear from her again. Later, at a press conference, Investigator Lieutenant Boswell said that the message was never clear about where she had actually made it to. Cell phone records indicated her last phone pinged off a cell tower at 4.40 a.m. on July 5th, but it was in the opposite end of the county from where her home was. Investigator Lieutenant Boswell said that the last ping was located approximately 4.22 miles south, southeast of a cell tower in Ephesus, Georgia. And he went on to say, that doesn't mean that's where she is at this moment. Only at 4.40 a.m. Sunday morning, July 5th, Natalie's cell phone was no longer communicating with any cell tower. And that if it does, he would get an email from Verizon stating the location. Natalie drove a very distinctive car, which was a 2002 hot pink four-door Chevrolet Cavalier with a blue stripe. So not only Natalie was missing, but her car was missing as well. Her county sheriff's department was leading the investigation, but due to the request of her family, Natalie's case had been placed on the GBI missing persons list. Despite the statement from Lieutenant Boswell, her family made a public post saying that her family and friends do not believe that she went willingly or that she would put her two boys, family, or friends through all of this. They went on to say it's sad we have reached this point that an investigator could treat her case and her with such flippant, disrespectful attitude. She would not have gone this long without contacting her family and friends. She did not leave to just get away. She has literally disappeared without a trace. Natalie's family continued to push out flyers everywhere. They posted all over social media, and a vigil was held by family and friends in honor of Natalie. They even went as far as creating a website, findnataliejones.com. There's another reason why this case is so personal to me. I didn't know Natalie, but I recognized her son's face immediately. Our two boys played Little League Baseball together. Her family never gave up, but their public posts became even harder to read as time went by. Throughout this, there was one person of interest that was not initially named, but due to a petition that was created by friends and family, Jonathan Lawrence, which was Natalie's ex-boyfriend, was later named as a person of interest in connection with her disappearance. They had broken up Christmas Day of 2019, according to her mother. Prior to all of this, he was arrested and charged with criminal attempted murder of a Troop County Sheriff's deputy. And on August 20th, the Criminal Investigations Division of Troop County Sheriff's Office launched an investigation claiming that 28-year-old Jonathan Lawrence, who was an inmate in the jail, had solicited the murder of a deputy. During that time, an undercover officer had been notified of a plan of action where Jonathan Lawrence had gone to great lengths to have this deputy murdered. And on September 2nd, they charged him with felony criminal attempt murder. He was arrested earlier in the year for drug trafficking and in early July, his bond was revoked. During that hearing though, there was testimony that Jonathan had been listed as a suspect in a stalking criminal trespass on July the 6th. Natalie, went missing the morning of July 5th. There was also testimony that his ex-wife had been receiving messages that were threatening to a friend of hers. An investigator testified that she had reviewed text messages from Jonathan that mentioned that friend. And also a judge, police officers, and Jonathan Lawrence's ex-wife. 
That investigator also testified that after reviewing the text, she then took out warrants against Jonathan for threatening a witness in judicial proceedings. That's when the judge revoked Jonathan's bond. He was out on bond at the time on terms to not leave his home except for specific purposes, and he had to wear an ankle monitor as well. Sheriff Ross had this to say in regards to Jonathan Lawrence's whereabouts the day Natalie went missing. We contacted the uh, folks who were monitoring his ankle monitor, and they were able to provide us tracking information of where he was during the time of uh, Natalie Jones's disappearance. The petition read, We, the aggrieved community, with our electronic signature attached, come before the Honorable Judge Baker as an elected official to request the Assembly of Georgia Grand Jury via petition to look into the following potential crimes. The role Jonathan Lawrence played in the disappearance presumed abduction of one Natalie Jones of Corinth, Georgia. The nefarious roles others associated with Jonathan Lawrence have played in the presumed abduction concealment of aforementioned Natalie Jones and the puzzling role Jonathan Lawrence's attorney's family's connections to the Georgia governor has played in the investigation of Jonathan Lawrence for drug trafficking, threatening a witness, arrest for plotting to kill a law enforcement, and the pursuit of the abductor to Natalie Jones. We assert the following. On the date of Natalie Jones' disappearance, it was well known to law enforcement that her ex-boyfriend, who she had met with the day prior, was a prime witness in his drug trafficking case, who lived but a scant mile from his home, who he contacted the day of her disappearance, should have been considered a prime person of interest. Within 10 days of Natalie Jones' disappearance, the same Jonathan Lawrence had his bond revoked for threatening a witness, also an ex-boyfriend of Natalie, over the same weekend Natalie vanished. Monitoring company records show Jonathan Lawrence had not adhered to the judge's instructions regarding strict limitations on his travels while on court-monitored bond, including odd travels to storage units and a trip 60-plus miles from his home on the day of Natalie's disappearance. Even in jail, Jonathan Lawrence was then arrested for plotting and soliciting the murder of a law enforcement officer, a potential witness, like Natalie, known to Natalie in Jonathan Lawrence's drug trafficking case, showing his inclination to use court-ordered confinement as an alibi and his ease of moving to solicitation to cover up intentions and complicate investigation. Law enforcement, while aware of the above, delayed after Natalie's disappearance to investigate Jonathan Lawrence's role until long after tower phone records were unavailable, video was unavailable, and witnesses to Jonathan's activities on July 4 had dispersed. In addition, phone records that were retrieved were shared with the public in a non-uniform manner. Impacting search efforts and storage buildings have not been searched and key video has not been requested. It is the public record that Jonathan Lawrence's attorney's wife is sister to the wife of the governor. One last note, Natalie was in an internet-based business with Jonathan and one other person, and she's the one who held the business license, which was registered in July of 2019. A little more than three months later, and a day after YouTube channel Adventures with a Purpose came to town to volunteer with her search, Natalie's 2002 pink four-door Chevrolet Cavalier with a blue stripe happens to appear in a field on October 6th. Neighbors say that the car was not there the day before.
it has been confirmed, If correct me if I'm wrong, that we do have, it has been confirmed that we have Natalie, we have the pink car. In addition to that, it has also been confirmed that this car was not here this morning. It's not. Was y'all been paying a long time ago? Nine, Nine, today's, today's the, the sixth. So it was been three months and one day. Uh, three. And not a word, not even nothing. Three. Having the investigators to hang up on me. Hey, we've been up and down these So many times. You guys been able to um, spot the car in there? You can see it? I, I can confirm. You see that thing? Right through there? No. Come where I am? Okay. In between those two trees. Oh, that's up there? Yeah. That's where they're at? I, I, I can't. And they have it covered? No, it's not covered. You can see the top of the car. It looks kind of pink, too. Well, if we just walk up there a little bit more, and then you can see it up there? Yeah, I was thinking walking in there, because then you get higher. Well, let's walk up there a little bit here and see. So we're, we're trying to get eyes on the uh, scene for you guys. Right in, right in there. Oh, yep, there it is. Pink car, right there, guys. 100%. There it is. That is the first official scene and sighting. Natalie's car, mom has confirmed it. I think PD is getting a little nervous. They're coming across the road again. Sir. Yes, sir. Can you please go back down the hill, sir? Absolutely, we can do so for you. When Natalie's car was found, she was in the driver's seat. And of course, Adventures with Purpose was out there live streaming. They had come into town the day before and were actively searching the ponds with their sonar and diving equipment when one of their viewers heard on the police scanner that a car had been found, so they stopped what they were doing and went over to that location. You can see from their live stream that the sheriff didn't seem too happy with their presence, and the next day he expressed frustration with misinformation being spread on social media. He told the Noonan Times Herald everything that has been said, 90% is just stuff they have fabricated. He said the car has been there probably from the day she went missing. The growth around the car was seven or eight feet tall. Sheriff Henry went on to say whoever fabricated that the car was not there, they caused a lot of trouble. Now, you can hear from their live stream that it was the neighbor that confirmed that the car was not there that morning. Natalie's family had driven up and down that road countless times. He went on to say who in the world would try to move a car that they have had hidden for three months? He said, if they had moved it, they would have had to have a helicopter set it in there and to put bushes around it. Clearly, that was just not the case. He also said that the growth around the car was seven or eight feet tall, that there were bushes grown up through the tires, through the bumper, and the car has clearly been there for a long period of time, he said. He said that the area was being treated as a crime scene, but that he didn't see anything as of yet to suspect foul play. The car showed no evidence of major damage from a crash, so it didn't end up in the woods accidentally. He said there was no wreck. The car was clearly driven to that location. There is an old wooded path that leads to a small field. The area likely wasn't grown up in July as it is now after a hot, wet summer. He said there was heavy, dense cover, including kudzu, around the car, and the car couldn't have been seen from the road. It was discovered when the landowner had hired someone to do some bush hogging on the land, said he made a few swipes and then saw the top of Natalie's car. It was also said that there was a lot of partying going on out there and the landowners were putting up cameras to put a stop to that. But my question is, if there was partying going on, even if someone wouldn't have seen her car recently, if the kudzu had grown up, wouldn't they have seen her car back in July, August, 
September, their most extensive search for Natalie had been focused on the southern and western sides of the county. He said it wasn't the north end where the vehicle was found, and investigators and family and friends have ridden the roads looking for signs, but the car was never visible from the road, Henry said. But as you can see from the photos, the car was visible. He went on to say if the landowner hadn't been doing some clearing and bush hogging and brush cutting, it would still be there. As you can see from the images of the car, it doesn't appear that the car has been sitting out there since July. And if you know anything about kudzu, it's been known to blanket an entire city in New Jersey. It grows approximately a foot a day, and it will literally climb up your leg if you stand there long enough. Natalie was removed from the car on site, and she was taken to the GBI for autopsy. But her car was taken to Heard County Law Enforcement Center. And if you take a look at these photos, you can see where there's not a lot of underbrush underneath her undercarriage. You don't see remnants of kudzu growing up through her bumpers. She didn't have hubcaps, so if they had grown through the wheels, surely we would have seen evidence of that when the car was up on the trailer. It was said that she was using her phone the night she disappeared, and investigators had tried to get records of her conversations with unknown subjects on social media. And when I asked if her phone was recovered, he responded with, we have recovered several things. But he has since stated that her phone was found. When the Herald asked if there was anything else he wanted the public to know, the sheriff said, my guys have been working tirelessly on this for three months. Social media has been our biggest obstacle to following up on opinions or theories. He went on to say, it's just frustrating the bad information that goes through here. It takes a lot of man hours to do that. It's just frustrating for law enforcement. There was a firestorm on Facebook. And one commenter said, those guys have been traveling the country looking for missing persons and have discovered three in the last year. They were searching waterways that had already been searched or where the local departments refused to search. They also removed cars from lakes and rivers to help the environment, something that no one else is doing. They do this relying entirely on donations from their viewers, and they do it to help families, not for money or fame. They were basing their info off of what locals in the area were telling them. The sheriff could have ended the speculation by simply providing some basic details early on, like we found the car back in the woods after a call came from a property owner who was clearing some brush. It looks like it's been there for a while, and others supported the sheriff. But Natalie's mother said that Natalie had been in a contentious custody battle at the time of her disappearance and told news outlets that she thought her daughter had been abducted. She doesn't agree that Natalie and her car have been in that same location this entire time. She said, I know we had 10 cars out and every one of them passed that spot where her car was found. And she hopes that anyone responsible for her daughter's death is held accountable. She said, my baby can't walk on this earth again. I'd appreciate it if they couldn't walk on it either. Some of the questions that people are asking is why did her body go to the GBI for autopsy, yet her car went to Heard County for processing? And although fingerprint powder is very fine, it can come in black or white, which would be graphite, or even a special fluorescent type powder that glows under a black light. People were asking why they couldn't see it when her car was up on the trailer. Some felt that it should have been processed right there in the field, or even her car along with Natalie should have both gone to the GBI. There's also a certain type of fingerprinting that can be done with chemical fumes, which react with the sweat and other organic residue left in latent fingerprints. Strong chemical fumes from the cyanacrylate in the glue will react with the residue from your fingers, and the chemical reaction causes the residue to turn white so you can see it. It's known that professionals also use ninhydrin, which reacts with amino acids in latent prints and sometimes silver nitrate powder, 
which is developed under a UV light. Most of us envision fingerprinting as this image here from a good friend of mine who recently had a break-in with the outdoor camera unit. As you can see, they dusted it and it doesn't come off no matter how many times she's tried to clean it. So I think that that leaves questions in people's mind when they are expecting something from a case and they're not getting their questions answered. For instance, when her cell phone pinged approximately 4.22 miles south-southeast of Ephesus, yet her body was found in the north part of Heard County, which then the sheriff said that was where her phone last pinged. So right there are some discrepancies. And as you can see, I pulled up the map of Heard County. I'm not a coordinates professional, but I will say it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see on the map where 4.22 miles south southeast is in relation to where Natalie was found. That's not the same distance. And out here, we don't have towers everywhere. It's very rural. It's not like in the city. So when a phone pings off of a tower, usually the maximum distance between that cell phone and the tower depends on many different factors. But in rural areas, the cell phone signals may have to travel up to several miles. And the ability to connect, you know, can be affected by landscaping, um, the size of the cell phone network, amongst other factors. And even sometimes the cell towers themselves transmit on a lower power on purpose so that it doesn't interfere with neighboring cell phones. I mean, a typical cell phone could travel up to 45 miles away, but out here, max distance may be as low as 22 miles. Then add in the other factors like the forest, hills, mountains, and structures but the most important thing here is that we know from the investigator that it came from that tower in Ephesus I don't know about you guys but as a woman and a mother it would be bad enough to drive from Alabama to where her car ended up or even to her home late at night on roads, back roads that have no street lights whatsoever. And then in addition to that, it just so happens that on July 5th, right after midnight, we had what's known as a penumbral lunar eclipse, where it made it 35% darker than it would normally be for that time of year. So it's pitch black out here in the middle of the night if we have the moonlight to go by 35 percent darker well you wouldn't catch me out in the middle of nowhere in a field i can tell you that and lastly i wanted to take you guys on a drive out there i didn't record the entire thing so if you want to fast forward now is the time but i wanted to give you an idea of just how rural these back roads are. In addition to that, Highway 100, this was rush hour, by the way, when I filmed this. So if it's that desolate at that time of day, just imagine what it would be like at that time of night.
pulled over to get this footage and there seems to be an increase in traffic. Now it looks like uh, either a friend of the family or family member has pulled up to plant a pink cross. So we're going to wrap it up and get back on the road and I'll come back tomorrow to get some more footage. If someone was going to go missing intentionally, they wouldn't plan to take a cruise just a little under a month before she went missing. Natalie picked up her passport because she had already purchased the tickets to go on a cruise. And her sister said she was hopeful for the future. Whatever happened, I pray for the family's sake that investigators find the answers and if someone is responsible for Natalie's death then I hope justice is fully served not only for Natalie but her family and most importantly her two little boys I raised both of my kids and I'm not leaving neither one of my kids so I don't care what anybody thinks about me I don't care. <laughs> I'm me. I love me. God loves me. And my life is very far from over. And whether that person agrees or whether this person agrees with my choices and my decisions, it really don't matter to me. I really don't give a two cents. So with that being said, I hope everybody has a wonderful day.